Thank you so much. Thank you, Chantal, for putting this together and everyone, all the volunteers and other speakers. I'm so honored to be here. I feel like I just have to take a breath and take in the room. And thank you for all of you coming out tonight. It's, um, you know, it's a big thing to take an evening, take a whole afternoon and evening for yourself and your vision and your business. So um, I want to talk tonight about moments of awe. And um, like a lot of parents, probably, I consider the moment of my son's birth, he's three now, to be um, probably my greatest moment of awe so far, the most incredible moment of my life um, to this point. And I would probably say that anyway, um, because the miracle of a baby coming, this part of my husband, this part of me, this child coming into the world that so clearly is from something so much bigger than the two of us, than from this, this miracle of life. But um, that moment of awe was intensified by the fact that he was born by a C-section and the um, person laying on the operating table as he was given birth was not me, but my then 61-year-old mother. So let me back up a minute. How did we get there? So my husband and I had always wanted children. We um, had talked about having children while we were still dating, you know, just um, early on. Always been part of the of our emerging vision together, and uh, we. We're living abroad. We moved back to the Chicago, threw away the birth control pills, like, let's go. And we um, didn't get pregnant. So I'm into holistic things. So we spent two years of Chinese medicine, acupuncture, pelvic floor yoga. If there was a shamanic healing, I was there. If there was any, th any sort of fertility goddesses, everything. So we did not get pregnant. We moved on to um, Western medicine and we did in vitro fertilization and we got pregnant. And we were pregnant with twin boys and we were ecstatic. And it was the first, we'd be the first grandchildren on both sides of the family. So everyone was very excited. And fairly far along into the pregnancy, I went into premature labor and the babies were delivered stillborn. And then we lost our twins. And it was just a gutting moment. And I'm sure many of us in this room, whether it's about having children or any other things, had that moment where something just is gone. And um, it was really hard, but we wanted this so much, so we kept trying. And a year later, we got pregnant again, had a miscarriage. And then we kept trying and didn't get pregnant. And we reached a point where we decided we needed to take a break, that it had just uh, financially depleted us, emotionally, spiritually. So we told our families, we're going to take a break, and we'll let you know when we have any, any news. And um, we just tried to open our hearts to what way this vision that we did feel wanted to emerge of us having a family and having children could happen. And during this time, my mother had just retired, and she, her deepest desire at this point, at 58, 59, was to um, find something she was passionate about. She's like, you know, I've done things that I'm good at, I've worked, but I, I want to find my passion. And so um, we would start having these calls every week, and she would say, you know, um, she would talk about her longing to find something that really mattered to her in, at this point in her life, and I would talk about my longing to have to be a mother and have children. And I would go on these walks um, in the woods and find these Y-shaped branches. And you know, this is what we were just what Chantal was talking about. You could say, well, it's a branch, so lots of branches are shaped like that. Who cares? But I would find these branches, and it was like that littlest, tiniest bit of encouragement, like keep going. I don't know if I thought it was a yes or a. Why chromosome? I don't know what, but it was something. So I would started collecting these branches, and my mother, um, so, you know, you're, you do all this coaching stuff. She'd never done any coaching therapy, anything. She surprised me by coming to a workshop that I was giving, a life coaching workshop, and um, we did vision boards. Some of you might have done that before. And she um, she said, I I don't know. You have to explain this to me. She had pictures of being healthy and pictures of a, a grandchild, which she really wanted. And she had um, this ostrich in the middle making this crazy face of joy, like, ah, you know. And um, she said, that's what I want. I want to feel like that ostrich. And and it just meant something to her. Like, back to, it doesn't make any sense logically, but she knew energy. That's what she wanted. And so she would call and say, um, you know, tell me, coach, what am I, you know, what do you recommend to people? And I said, well, you know, meditation, walks in nature, journaling. And we were, we had no idea, of course, our visions would have anything to do with each other. We were just in that place of sharing and sharing the grief and sharing the longing. 
And so one day my mother's walking with some friends and this woman says, oh, I heard about this postmenopausal woman who had a baby and should we be concerned? And, you know, they're all laughing and, you know, and she came home and suddenly she said, it just went through her like a shock wave. And she said, oh my God, the ostrich moment of awe. Like that, and she had this idea. So she came to Chicago, she wrote this idea in a letter, she um, presented it to my husband and I And I don't know if it was the years of trying of grief or whatever, but this idea that's so crazy sounding, I was like, maybe, maybe there's something there. You can imagine dinner that night at my house with my (laughs) husband, my father, my mother and I sitting around like, so, um, and we decided as a family, we wanted to try to see if this was possible. So... We went with some trepidation to our fertility doctors, thinking there was a likely chance they might call the people in the white coats down to have a chat with us. And then my team of doctors, which we were well acquainted at that point, um, sat around and, and they said, well, we'd have to do a lot of tests, you know, blood pressure, cardiovascular, all these things, someone at this age to carry a child, but it's possible. Moment of awe. And then my husband said, I just have to ask, I mean, so what's the difference between 30-year-old uterus, 60-year-old uterus? What, what are we, you know, like, what are the risks? What are... My doctor pauses. She's this she's 70-some-year-old woman who's had 10 children. So it's like, so who you want as a fertility doctor. You know, she's got it down. And she says, well, no difference. And it was like this new moment of awe emerged. You know, we think about our biological clocks and our eggs and all of the things that factor in, but the uterus to a certain extent, doesn't lose its power, doesn't age, and our awe at the female reproductive system and what it's capable of, and my mother feeling like as a woman at this point in her life, when she feels like the messages can be like, you're done, who cares? You know, like, no, I'm alive. Like, there's creativity here. And there's a woman, Christine Northrup, many of you might know her work, really impactful to me early on in my life. And and she talks about even those of us that maybe don't have our actual reproductive organs. You know, people have had operations. I had an ovary removed when I was 15 in an emergency. I've heard from women since I've read written my book about our experience who were born without ovaries or without a uterus, that the energy of that is always within us. The energy of our, our creativity and our power here is there. So we enter this moment of awe and we try this crazy idea. A couple months later, we get pregnant. And I am full of fear, I'm full of joy. It's so, I'm there for everything. I flew to DC to be with my brother at the beginning. She came and moved in with us for the second part of the pregnancy. And we started uh, reading Harry Potter to the baby. Because that's what I just, it's the only thing I could think to really do. And I knew what it had been like being pregnant with our twins, and I felt pregnant. I felt connected to this baby. And it was like, my mom kept saying, what if, what if all these walls, like what Chantal was saying, what if there's not this separation, the barriers that we think, what if, you know, we made lots of jokes to relieve our anxiety. So it was like, uh, you know, people say it takes a village to raise a child. It took a village for us to have a child. And, you know, kind of like awkward, you know, Christmas cards we could send that year. (laughs) Woman carries son-in-law's baby, you know, like, Weekly World News headings. So, you know, we just tried to try to lighten it up because, because it felt like the stakes were high. And, and living in our emerging vision, the stakes are high. And so we, we're we reading Harry Potter, and, and I'm wondering, is this baby going to know me? I don't know. I know how I feel, and I feel connected, but I don't know. And all of a sudden, my mom's saying, oh, he's kicking, he's kicking. And every time I would talk then, every time I'd come in the room, he's kicking. And then I, just, he knows you. And we didn't know if it was a he. We just kept thinking it was, and, and he was. So then it's time to have the baby. And we are um, in the hospital, and my mother's, uh, you know, 36 hours of labor. They did not uh, do any discounts for um, senior uh, <laughs> pregnancies. She was thinking she would get, but it was early, early labor, not, not painful. And, and it was time and we got to go, and I got to go into the operating room. My husband had to pace the you know, hallways at Prentice and just one person was allowed in and I'm there and I'm with my mother and I'm holding under her arm and we're just, as someone who'd had children die, all I was waiting for was that sound you know, just that sound of that cry. 
And I'm holding on to my mother and we're sort of the tears are starting and they're saying, he's coming, he's coming. And I can still feel it. And they lift him out and there's this pause and then the cry. And it just was like, people were saying, oh, you waited nine months. It was like seven years and nine months. <laughs> it was seven years and nine months. And, and he arrived and, and Finn's placed in my arms and it's like moment of awe. And it was incredible. So two weeks later, my mom and my parents stayed at our house for a while so she could recuperate and give burping lessons. And um, good, good, wonderful grandmother, things like that. And we decided to do a visioning, which is something I do in these workshops that my mom had liked. And it's essentially a lot of uh, people here have um, probably practiced it. Michael Beckwith in L.A. introduced me to it. And so the idea is that you sort of get in a meditative space and just ask, like, what is the highest vision? And my mother was thinking, well... I've done this huge mystical thing and and like what's next and and I'm thinking I'm stepping into this whole new time of in role of being a mother and what's next so we we just asked these questions what what is the next vision what is the highest vision and I was getting from my mother like maybe you're going to be teaching visioning to people and her time she's thinking oh my gosh and then she was getting the same thing and then for me it was like writing and mommying and mommying and writing and, and I was uh, not knowing exactly that I would write the book I wrote, bringing in Finn for that first year of his life, but that was coming quickly after this visioning. And we're, we're together bonding. And then in visioning, we asked this question, is there anything else we need to know? And I said, oh, did you get something for that? And she said, yeah, it's so weird. I mean, you know more about this visioning stuff, but I, yeah, it, it said, I heard or felt, um, tell Sarah, you are chosen, not broken. And what I got in that moment is with all the awe and all the miracles, I still had a story going, I'm defective. Like there's this thing that my body can't do that everybody else can do. There's this way that it's not, it's not whole and it's not right. And I, I'm you know, pathetic for needing help. All that stuff, that messages, like all that, that making weakness wrong, making vulnerability wrong, making oneness not necessary that we've, Chantal introduced already. So I had this moment of, oh, like, oh, my gosh. And a few months later, I hear this Zen story about uh, this piece of wood. And it was a perfectly wonderful piece of wood, beautiful even. And it was a piece of wood. And it wasn't until the holes were carved through the wood and the cracks were made through the wood that this amazing sound could come through, that, that no sound no other sound could sound like this sound. And no sound could come through unless these cracks and these holes were there. And I really was thinking about tonight that absolutely our emerging, our visions, absolutely come from our, our greatness, our passion, our genius. But maybe they also come from the places that we've called broken and those cracks and those holes. And I was thinking that as we sit here tonight and have this awesome opportunity to listen to the stirrings of our heart and our emerging, that we can keep honoring the genius and the passion and the bliss, but maybe also bring in those places we've called broken. Maybe that's exactly where our next miracle is going to take place. Thank you. <laughs>